Hi friends, welcome to the mains answer writing practice. Today we will look at the question number, look at the answers for the questions 10 and 11, which I have given in my previous video. So those who have uh, submitted the answers to the mains with gmail.com, your answers will be evaluated soon. Tenth question that I have given is about integral humanism. See the question carefully. It is asking, what do you mean by integral humanism? In ethics, generally, the UPSC will ask you, what do you mean by? So that even if you learn about the concept, you no need to write what the thinker or author has talked about it. For example, the concept of integral humanism was given by Pandit Deen Dayal Upadhyay. However, you no need to write exactly what he said. You can write in your own language what to understand by that. Similarly, do you think it is relevant in the contemporary times? So, coming to the answer, you write a small introduction. Because in the question, there is no statement. Both the questions are direct. So, directly come to the answer. If you want an introduction, just write one or two lines. Simply say in the introduction that integral humanism is a set of concepts, a set of principles uh, that were developed by Deen Dayal Upadhyay. Pandit Dindal Upadhyay, mainly for the purpose of the national development, India of independence, how shall India's social economics policies shall be designed for the development. In that way, he has designed them. With such a small introduction, you come to the actual question. You write, what do you mean by integral humanism? As I told you, integral humanism is not a single line, a set of concepts. You have to write in multiple points. For example, one thing it, it talks about is, human being should be at the center of overall, overall development of any nation not the wealth but the human being then it is again as the materialism for example the western liberalism talks about individuality individualism whereas the marxism the marxism states states that there is no place for individualism the state machinery actually kind of does not give any importance to the individualism in the marxist principle so integral humanism is a median between these two it does not accept the western liberalism it also do not accept the, does not accept the Marxism because both are materialistic. It is again as a materialism. Similarly, integral humanism also says that the four ingredients of the individual, that is the body, the mind, the intelligence and the soul, all four shall be integrated in a unison. For example, yoga. Yoga is a practice that tries to integrate the body, mind, you know, the intelligence, that means wisdom and the soul. Similarly, it also talks about Dharma or the Kama Moksha. Dharma is the moral principles, Ardha is wealth, Karma is Kama, Kama is desire and Moksha is salvation. So the moral principles along with wealth creation, desire and salvation should go hand in hand. For example, the westernization, the industrial revolution or technologies focus on only Ardha and Kama. However, the true progress can happen only when you focus on dharma and moksha also. However, the integral humanism is a broader thing. It has more points to add, but keep them for the remaining part of the question. As question has two parts, you keep these points for the next part of the question. Next part of the question says, is it relevant to the contemporary times? You say, of course, it is relevant to the contemporary times and try to prove it by giving some examples. While, giving, uh, while telling its contemporary importance, try to mention some current affairs, if you know any international reports, mention that any constitution articles also you can mention. Don't think that ethics means you should write only philosophy, only thinkers, only theory, not required. Ethics means you can combine the polity, combine the economy, combine the current affairs, you can write it so that your answers will be enriched, they will be more relevant. Okay. Okay. How the uh, integral humanism is relevant to the contemporary times? First one, it focuses on economic equality. You can say the Oxfam report said that. 1%, top 1% of the world, global richest people control more wealth than what is controlled by the remaining 90% of the people. So this kind of problem can be solved when the entire world focuses on the economic equality. For example, even in India, taxation is a form of redistribution of the wealth. And the government schemes like MGNRGA, you know, other government schemes focusing on the poor people is, is one kind of economic redistribution. So thus, thus it is relevant. The Antyodhya. The concept of Antyodhya is a part of integral humanism. Antyodhya says that the poorest of the poor, the last man standing, shall get the benefits of you know the economic development, the social progress of the nation. It is similar to the Sarvodaya concept of Mahatma Gandhi. Sarvodaya concept. 
so it is relevant then the government the good governance and the government policies shall be woven around the people but not woven around the material not woven around the wealth also the integral humanism talks talks about taking a middle path the government policies should not be very harsh same time they should not be soft on the violators where should be punished so it should be a middle path middle path only then the policies can be easily followed by the people as well as the government then it also talks about vasudeva kutumbakam the integral humanism means vasudeva kutumbakam that means entire world comes from the same family the human family so don't treat different castes or religions in different light so if, if this concept is really internalized understood by the students with the people of india through curriculum school curriculum definitely the caste wars the caste conflicts religious conflicts ethnic uh, wars they would be avoided definitely similarly the corruption you can say in the contemporary times corruption is prevalent in society mainly because uh, people are focusing on the ardha the wealth and the kama the desire if they were thought about the dharma and its importance and if people are are you know uh, realize the importance of dharma naturally corruption will come down in society corruption cannot be reduced just by you know strong government policies or by judiciary or by punishment no it, it can be reduced only when the people realize the importance of dharma the moral values and you know the salvation the principle of salvation moksha similarly article 51 51 of constitution of india is following integral humanism it says that peaceful coexistence along with defending one's nation you should look at the international peace that is possible uh, through the integral humanism concept also sustainable development goals goal number 16 says that all the institutions globally shall be inclusive inclusive institutions and friends this is actually mentioned in the integral humanism integral humanism says that in the entire world all sections of the world shall be represented so the same concept is mentioned in the sustainable development goal 16 so for example if you look at the united nations security council it is not representing all sections of the world so you can mention that example also similarly sustainable goal development goal number 13 13 says that uh, climate change climate change action we have to work uh, to stop this climate change and we are to give importance to environment ecosystem biodiversity nature it is mentioned in the integral humanism it said that the human beings animals birds the plants everybody shall be living in a unison we should not think that the world is only for human beings so if these concepts of integral humanism are understood by the people definitely in the contemporary times we can improve the world a lot so in these lines you can conclude the answer conclude the answer coming to the next question friends in the history generally what happens is upsc history questions in the mains general studies paper 1 if you look at the questions they are highly analytical the questions were not factual in the last 4 to 5 years upsc history questions are not factual they are highly analytical however though they are analytical though your answers are also analytical you don't forget to mention the facts when you are writing analytical answer along with that you have to you know throw in some facts here and there only then your answer would be getting good marks okay okay let's look at the question what are the new forces that emerged in the 1920s means 1920 to 30 the third decade 1920s in the indian freedom struggle so what are the new forces and discuss their role see here this kind of questions i would say in this kind of questions the upsc is forcing the aspirant forcing the uh, student to repeat the points what you will do what most students will do is first they will write list of all the forces first question second question they will again discuss the role of each force so you are repeating your answer do not do that so combine entire question write a single answer you write a new force for example if you think youth is a force if you think uh, farmers is a force just mention the force write write its contribution to contribution to the freedom movement so you write both parts in a you know in a single answer rather than making two separate answers okay also friends uh, how do how should you write introduction for this kind of questions i would say write a very small introduction because in this question there is no statement directly they ask the questions so you write a brief introduction before 1920 what happened just say that in 1919 after the rowlet satyagraha by mahatma gandhi mahatma gandhi actually became a leader for the national uh, movement for india national freedom movement for india and uh, is called the gandhi era the 1920s is called the gandhi era so during that era you say along with gandhi there are many other forces 
that emerge into the national movement let us look at those forces like let us look at those forces along with that we have to discuss their role you write what is the force that came also you discuss the role of the force friends see discuss the role means you no need to say that you know this force is highly useful for the national movement no need to say that you can in fact say that this force is kind of uh, again is national movement this force helped for national for example the youth helped in the national movement however you can say the the caste movements could not help in the national movement you can write in both ways you have discussed that okay let's come to the uh, the actual answer so here i mentioned various forces that came in 1920s okay for example look at the prisons prisons actually came across as a new force till 1920s the the uh, prisons participation in the national movement was less in fact the importance goes to gandhi here it's because of gandhi that actually prisons are able to come into the national movement you can mention few facts for example bardoli satyagraha in gujarat you can write its importance its importance is that uh, it actually brought new leaders like the sardar vallabhai patel new leaders came into existence and these leaders later on were able to participate in the national movement and decide the direction of the national movement then you know even the the you know the rampa chodavaram the rampa rebellion in the andhra pradesh it brought a new leader raju to the forefront and he created a kind of fearlessness so it actually made people think that we can fight against the british that is very important that is very important even the you know the road war areas right war areas of uh, madras bombay they also have a lot of uh, peasant movements and in those movements they are able to go against the landlords and uh, the lower class of society the small farmers are able to come to the forefront and later on they are able to contribute to the national movements then next next important force that emerged in 1920s is the youth the student force students started forming into the conferences start forming into kind of groups and no and uh, uh, for example all bengal student conference uh, 1928 jawahar lal nehru presided over this conference jawahar lal nehru 1928 okay so this kind of uh, youth movements created awareness among the people among the youth particularly and youth participation actually helped in the national movement in the later years you can say that then caste movements for example see the self respect movement of madras or you know the satya sodak activists in maharashtra particular in pune the satya sodak activists played a very important role in the caste movements even the you know the uh, periyar the periyar periyar self respect movements even the justice party the justice party of madras these were actually the caste movements of course see their role in the national movement was not prominent because as they were focusing mostly on the casteism uh, it sidelined the national movement however there are some caste movement which actually created a kind of consciousness it created consciousness among the lower classes and they became politically aware they became politically aware and they could actually participate in the national movement in the later years you can mention that then the workers movement see you don't to mention all workers movement just write one or two for example the trade unions lot of trade unions started forming in 1920s particularly the all india trade union congress in 1920 made the workers come together fight against mostly british british uh, for better workers conditions mostly they fought against the british for better workers conditions though their aim is not the india, not india's independence as their enemy is common enemy british congress and other parties were able to you know bring these workers into the mainstream national movement national movement okay that you can mention then revolutionary activists as you know though in 19 early 1920s the non cooperation movement was started by the started by gandhi it was winded up it was wound up you know gandhi withdrew it within few years then a political vacuum was created that was filled by swarajis as well as revolutionary activists you can mention a few the yugantar you can mention about the yugantar the anushilan anushilan you know even the you know the hindustan republic association also you can mention that you know chitagong revolutionary party by you know surya sen by surya sen you can mention these people you can say that they actually developed the fearlessness among the youth and you know uh, people who uh, during the political vacuum it kept the national movement running national movement running even but you have to say also say see you should be cautious here you should also say that though revolution activists are able to contribute for national movement 
they could not evolve the broad short, broad social objectives required for the national movement they were you know short lasting they were for very small time they could not help in the long term uh, national movement even swaraj's see swaraj actually participated in the elections elections in, in 1920s and they won almost i think 42 seats they won out of 100 or 101 seats they won they won 42 seats and these 42 seats for the people along with the other indian groups together they were able to, they were able to form a formidable group in the central legislative assembly they were able to vote down many government policies also they were able to tell the people about through powerful speeches they were able to tell about the you know the civil liberties the self government even they were able to expose the hollowness of the montague kelsfall reforms 1919 reforms of course they came in 1921 but uh, people used to think that they are good reforms but the swaraj were able to expose the weakness of those reforms in that way they were helpful for the national movement finally the communists not only the communist part of india overall the communists were also a new force emerged in 1920s the communist part of india was also formed in 1920 it was formed in tashkent actually by m n roy and others they actually did not did not come along the you know caste lines they came along with class lines the peasant class the workers class they mobilized the masses and later they were able to help the independence movement of india but again be cautious here they actually opposed the quit india movement and in fact the opposer gandhi because of which they could not get good support also finally within congress there are some socialists see the the congress policies particularly the gandhian policies were not liked by some of the youth who want radical change of the social economic structure of india for such kind of radical youth uh, to keep them within the congress the socialists actually helped Uh, the nehru nehru jawala nehru subhash chandra bose you know they they led the socialists in the congress and uh, they have, in fact they were also able to make the india's independence movement international that's why they call nehru as internationalist so uh, they were able to garner the international support for the india independence movement it helped in the national movement like that these are the various forces and how each force contributed you can write one or two lines so in that way finally you can conclude small conclusion saying that though uh, their methods are different their policies their ideas are different together they were able to contribute to the national movement of india and uh, we could uh, you know finally achieve independence in 1947 in that way you can conclude friends so these are the questions for tomorrow day after tomorrow day after tomorrow try to write answer try to keep only 10 minutes for each question 10 minutes for each question just see the question write the answer in 20 minutes both the questions and mail it to mainswithsarath@gmail.com we would be evaluating your answers see you friends bye